The, good evening, everyone. This is Mark Nykirk. I'm the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU, one of the partners in the Northern Kentucky Forum. And thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, we uh, at the forum uh, love to be in person with you, but uh, that's not possible right now. So for the past few months, we've been doing our forums uh, via Zoom, uh, and we hope to be back in person at some point in the future. And uh, Often we have them in the morning, so we'll have a cup of coffee with you, but we also do evening uh, forums. So watch for the opportunity when we'll be back together. But in the meantime, we'll continue to do these uh, forums uh, by Zoom to talk about uh, important issues in our community. Uh, we've done, I think, 10 of them since uh, uh, April uh, to look at uh, issues in our community around COVID-19, beginning with a dialogue with Lynn Sattler from the health department about uh, the health issues involving COVID-19. But I know that uh, this topic, uh, how we are going to go back to school is a particular interest to our community. Uh, so uh, we have uh, frankly waited as long as we can in the summer so we get more clarity about what the possibilities and probabilities are. Uh, but now we're getting close to uh, school starting back. So we have a wonderful panel with us this evening and I'll introduce them in just a moment. I want to tell you that you'll notice at the bottom of your screen uh, is a place for Q&A. Uh, so uh, look, uh, uh, if you have a question, uh, post it there and we'll monitor those and ask our panelists um, uh, those questions. So uh, uh, thanks for being with us and uh, 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 get your questions ready, but uh, uh, let me uh, introduce you to our panel uh, this evening. Uh, we have some superintendents and some other education voices with us and uh, they are going to uh, unmute and show their screens right now. So we'll have uh, the panel in front of us in just a second. And I think we have a little bit of difficulty with uh, uh, one connection, but I think we're gonna try to, try to get that straightened out, so. Um, so we have uh, uh, three superintendents, Jay Brewer from uh, Dayton Independent Schools. Welcome, Jay. Uh, Matt, Matt Turner, who uh, is uh, uh, the superintendent at Boone County uh, Schools and had the good fortune of becoming a new superintendent just as uh, COVID-19 started. So that's gotta be fun, Matt. Uh, and uh, Alvin Garrison, the superintendent at Covington is uh, working on his connection. So we think we'll have Alvin here shortly. Uh, also with us is Tony uh, Walden. Tony is uh, uh, a parent and a member of the PTA uh, locally and on the state board, uh, our representative from the state PTA board uh, uh, from Northern Kentucky. And Tony is also uh, on the site-based council at Scott High School, correct, Tony? Uh, and, that is uh, correct. Uh, and also has served on site-based uh, at elementary and grade uh, uh, middle school levels of so long time. Um, uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, citizen engagement in um, uh, uh, public education in our community. So thank you, Tony, for being with us. And Bridget Ramsey is the uh, president and CEO of the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence, uh, which has been a longtime advocate in our state for um, support for education and, uh, and education reform. Uh, and uh, uh, Bridget has some good Northern Kentucky connections also, including a son at uh, enrolled at NKU, so uh, uh, she's an NKU parent, which is uh, fantastic. The forum uh, is a partnership of uh, uh, our center, the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU, along with the three public library districts. And our commitment is to uh, discuss uh, 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 public topics uh, in uh, 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 of interest uh, uh, in Northern Kentucky. So that's uh, what we're all about. We're not advocating for anything other than to be educated on public affairs. Um, so thanks for being with us and we'll get started and I'll watch for your questions as they come in. And I think, uh, hope we get uh, Alvin Garrison with us uh, shortly, but we can start. Uh, 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 Jay Brewer uh, uh, has a, a, a city district, uh, uh, small in comparison to others. Uh, so there's some unique uh, things in your district, Jay, I'm sure. But he also is uh, immediate past president of uh, the Superintendents Association. Uh, and one of the things in Northern Kentucky that happens uh, is that our superintendents stay in communication with each other. So Jay, I'm wondering uh, what it looks like both from the standpoint of your district and what you're hearing from your fellow superintendents in these challenging times. Yeah, well, um, excited to be here with you guys tonight. 
Uh, we'll say uh, NKCS is a great organization for us. I know Alvin's on here. He's a past president as well. Um, and, and I will say our, our school superintendents in Northern Kentucky are a pretty close group. And uh, we share, meet, text, uh, call, uh, bail each other out uh, quite often. So uh, we really try to stay on the same page and help each other out as best we can. Um, in regards to uh, where we are at Dayton, you know, we are one of the smaller school districts in Northern Kentucky. You know, we have about 900 students, uh, preschool through 12th grade. Uh, we're located along the river here for those, uh, sometimes people are unsure exactly where Dayton is. Uh, we, we float along the river by Bellevue, Newport, uh, Covington, and Ludlow. Um, we're, we're very proud of the, the work that we've been doing here lately. I've got a great team rallying around uh, our Dayton uh, school community. Um, I think we're in pretty unprecedented times, and I think that goes without saying. Um, our current philosophy as we take on the school year, and I was talking to Matt Turner a little bit earlier, um, you know, we're, we're going to use the mindset that we're going to move into this slowly. Uh, we're going to walk before we run uh, kind of a, a mindset. Uh, I personally uh, have, have learned some valuable lessons over the years uh, as a marathon runner. And I really think we're in for a very long school year uh, for both the students, both the parents and uh, for our staff. So uh, Probably the, the biggest mistake most marathon runners make is going out too fast, uh, getting overwhelmed, and then uh, just shutting down and quitting in the middle of the year or the middle of the race. So we certainly don't want to overwhelm our folks at the beginning of the school year. So we're looking at a plan uh, that will bring folks back at about a 40 percent uh, level. Um, and then build our way up from the successes that we have early on. So uh, we're going to walk before we run. We're going to try to balance, I think, what we're all trying to balance here, which is uh, a strong need for our students to get back into school, to have those social relationships that are so key uh, for their growth and development uh, with the uh, serious nature of uh, a COVID-19 pandemic and keeping our staff, our students, and, and our uh, school community safe. So um, I look at that scale, and every time you, you, you find something that works for one group, it tips it to the other side, and it really creates an issue uh, there for them. So, um, you know, it's quite the Rubik's Cube that we're working with here um, along that way. But um, I have great faith in our Green Devil community and the leaders and the teachers and the community members that we have here. Uh, to all pull together, uh, do this safely, and, and do this for our kids. Uh, thank you, uh, Jay. Uh, Alvin, if, uh, Alvin Garrison is with us now, and Alvin is a, a superintendent in uh, the Covington schools. Uh, and um, um, I'm w wondering, Alvin, if I could uh, uh, not only look forward, but look a little bit uh, backward. We, you had to end the academic year uh, uh, with modifications and I guess uh, you know it's uh, typical of all of us, and particularly educators, to learn from experience. Did uh, how the uh, uh, the school year ended uh, guide you on how you can start back? Uh, uh, what what lessons were learned about uh, this sudden change to uh, uh, online education? Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm wondering if. Everyone can hear me. Yeah. Well, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, glad to see everyone out there. Hope everyone's staying healthy and safe. Uh, as reflecting on uh, last year, closing out the year, I think the main thing uh, that's different from last year to this year is the time for planning. We at least, uh, uh, you know, with three days preparation last year, uh, you know, I take my hats off to all the teachers in the state of Kentucky, uh, all the leaders out there that uh, made NTI possible with three days of planning, real challenge for, for school districts. And I just compliment our teacher leaders and administrators and, and entire school staff for making the adjustments and, and being flexible and making it happen for our kids. With that being said, I think uh, the missing piece last year for us is uh, due to not having the planning time or not uh, being able to uh, 
you know, in some cases, our kids not having the access to like internet access, or even uh, we were not totally prepared infrastructure wise with computers, uh, K to 12 or PK to 12. Uh, it was really hard to implement the kind of instruction and remote learning needed for kids. So basically, last year, what we learned, it was mainly a a time where kids, not a whole lot of new learning occurred from March to May. It was mainly review. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what we hope to differ with the start is uh, we went out, we've tried to purchase enough computers to ensure that every kid has one three to 12. We are in the process of uh, trying to get a, a learning management system that will complement kids. And we're also trying to uh, make sure that internet access will not be such a problem this year for students as it was at the close of last year. Uh, again, uh, we still think there's room for growth and learning. Uh, we think uh, day one is going to look very different than day two. Week one is going to look very different from week two because we hope through the process, as uh, Superintendent Brewer alluded to, we hope that we'll con continue to learn and, and learn from mistakes, learn from uh, things that we do well. And uh, like Superintendent Brewer said, this is going to be a very different school year. Uh, when we always talk about continuous learning and continuous improvement, this will definitely be the year for continuous learning and continuous improvement from superintendent down to uh, down to uh, a volunteer or sub substitute. So again, we're excited about the challenge. Uh, a, a little, uh, of course, fear of the unknown, but uh, I think uh, us, along with all the educators across the state, will, will you know, will uh, meet the challenge. So I hope I answered the question. But uh, yeah, we, we learned a lot from the previous uh, three months, and we hope through planning we can have a very different learning environment and a very different uh, education at the start of this school year. Thank you. Uh, uh, Matt Turner, you... Uh are the newest superintendent among the, uh, I guess really the newest superintendent in Northern Kentucky and uh, and you had this great advantage of becoming superintendent right as a pandemic uh, 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 hit. Uh, I know you had uh, uh, experience uh, uh, as a principal and administrator prior to that, but uh, how uh, how's it going uh, for Boone County, which is our largest school district and uh, has uh, 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 both uh, uh, really kind of uh, suburban city and rural schools, a lot of diversity of demographics there. And thank you for having me on. And usually after I get congratulated on being the superintendent, right away someone says, boy, you really picked a bad time to be the superintendent, didn't you? Um, it's, it's been a, a challenging, a challenging uh, start, that's for sure. But I think that's true for whether experienced or not. I mean, this is just um, such a complicated task that we're, uh, we're, we're being asked to, uh, to move forward into. Uh, our staff has done a great job. Um, our district leadership has worked extremely hard. Our school principals have worked extremely hard ever since the end of the school year last year. And uh, for us, that's, that's been a big challenge trying to get everyone together. We have 24 schools in our, in our entire district. Uh, we range in our county from areas that are urban to suburban to rural. Uh, so we have, uh, we have lots of diversity in many different ways um, within our county. And, and so it's, it's a struggle just trying to make sure, struggle may not be the right word, but it's a challenge to try to get everyone on the same page, to try to be consistent. Um, you know, the more we work on reopening plans, uh, we when we feel like we've got something figured out, we realize there's 10 other things that we've got to then try to figure that out as well. It's just uh, almost like peeling back the onion. There's just multiple layers to everything that we're trying to do. Um, but we're, we're making progress. We're, we're moving forward. Um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to the new year, seeing kids and hopefully we can see kids, but also to be honest, there's, there's concern. There's, there's a little bit of uh, fear out there with, uh, with some of our parents, some of our students, some of our teachers and administrators. And um, 
you know, we're going to have to, uh, to to work very hard to try to make sure we keep people safe and also work very hard to try to, to make sure that we do a good job educating our kids. Thank but you. We'll uh, dig into some of those specifics uh, as we uh, um, move along. Uh, uh, but uh, I think we're start to get a, a picture of challenge from the superintendents. Uh, Tony uh, uh, Walden, uh, uh, you're a parent. You also serve on a site-based uh, council and on the PTA. What uh, uh, What's this look like from the standpoint of a, a parent and what are you hearing as uh, our state representative from the PTA from uh, parents? Well, I can tell you that mostly what I'm hearing is um, pretty much what the superintendent said. Um, from that, for them, it's it's scary. It's it's kind of different for the parents. It's extremely scary. Um, we have so many options that we've heard put out there. Um, in the different districts in our area. And fortunately, um, we cover about eight different school districts in our area. So we hear a lot of different opinions and a lot of parent voices, but there is, um, I know we need to take it slow, but I think it's just the fear of the unknown for the parents as well. We're just constantly wondering if we're making the right decision. And I know um, recently within the, starting yesterday, um, Kenton County parents are now making that determination whether you want your kids to um, return to in-person school or whether you want to do the synchronous learning, which is the path that was chosen, or whether you want to do um, the online learning. And it's a lot. Um, we're all trying to exchange notes with each other, so to speak, and try to figure out what's the best option for us um, moving forward and how are the kids going to do different things. Um, school is not going to be the same. It's not going to look the same as what um, I think some of the parents, which has been um, a big topic for me, is explaining to the parents as I get things from um, the um, school board through the SBDM, it's, it's not going to be what a lot of kids are going to think it's going to look like. Um, we're used to having the freedom in the hallways and the social time, and that's gonna drastically change. So I think for the parents now, we're also regrouping in that sense and trying to make sure that we want the best education that we can get for them and make the proper decisions, but we're also, our main focus is on the health and safety of all of the children and one of the smaller things that was well, not small at all um, but we also have to remember the teachers and all of this because um, I, we hear a lot of the kids not um, you know they're they're not having the symptoms with COVID they're more asymptomatic and the non-transfer but we have our teachers and our other staff members and our bus drivers who they're exposed to that and they're the older people. So we have a lot to consider when we're making those decisions for our kids. And I think that's one of the biggest scary things for parents is we just don't know. It's the fear of the unknown is what everybody seems to be going with right now. Uh, Bridget Ramsey, uh, you, you see this from a statewide perspective. Uh, the Pritchard Committee also is uh, always in uh, uh, Frankfurt to advocate for public schools. Um, What's uh, this look like at a statewide level and what are some of the advocacy issues? Uh, certainly, uh, we're going to have a, uh, some budget issues to deal with. And I think you're probably used to going to Frankfurt and saying we uh, need more money for public schools. And uh, this time we need, uh, well, we may need more, but we need to avoid drastic cuts. I just, what's, what's this look like from your perspective? Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you to everybody listening in. This is such an important topic, and it's so important that um, community members, citizens are really engaged to support our schools, to support our families. And so I just want to echo all of our superintendents, kind of hats off to our educators, our um, education leaders, who just doubled down with rapid response um, as all of our school children had to leave school buildings, teachers had to leave school buildings, and our educators had to figure it out on the fly. 
um, and to see our educators in the neighborhoods where our students were trying to connect with them in any which way, I think was an inspiration for all of us. And knowing how hard all of our educators have worked all summer long to figure out what next um, is a tribute to their commitment um, and also underscores the uncertainty. So just for quick background, I think, you know, less than two months ago, the American Academy of Pediatricians was recommending that school children get back into school buildings. Um, that has changed already just in a very short amount of time as COVID cases are spiking across the nation. And it's resulted in just what you've heard here today in um, superintendents, our building leaders doubling down to try and uh, revise plans. Um, and doing that with health and safety in mind first and foremost, but also the commitment and the promise of delivering on our education goals. So it's an incredibly trying time and it is so important for our community to step up um, and be part of supporting our families, our students and our educators. So, you know, Mark, what we're seeing, um, you ask about kind of lessons learned. And I think one thing that has been important for us to, to underscore as we've thought about lessons learned, we've heard loud and clear um, that relationships were the bright silver lining in the few months of COVID in the last school year between March and May, as Superintendent Garrison mentioned. While there might not have been a lot of new information shared from a learning standpoint, educators found new ways to connect with students and students found new ways to connect with their educators and relationships were clearly forged in ways that there may not have been opportunities for before. And so I think as we move forward with a focus on um, a new normal, um, a next normal and a new normal. So we've thought about it as now, the next normal and the new normal. And whatever we're learning, especially the silver linings, um, need to be part of our innovations for the future because we will move to a new normal. And these, some of these things are the things we need to hold fast to. And the relationships that are being built between teachers and their students are one of those things we need to hold on to. So I would really prioritize that from the lens of families, community members, um, all those interested in this conversation as we move forward. Let's make sure we double down on the relationship building because that's what our students and families really need right now. Um, and our edu educators are playing a really important role, making sure our students and families have what they need. Um, as far as funding, my goodness, Mark, um, that's gonna be the real challenge on the horizon that's gonna be difficult for all of us. Um, so we've heard that the consensus forecasting group, which kind of estimates revenue into the budget um, each year and certainly before budget sessions, is forecasting um, anywhere from a 20 to a 30% reduction in revenue into the state budget. And so that's gonna hit everybody really hard. Um, it's going to hit K-12 hard, it's going to hit early childhood hard, it's going to hit post-secondary hard. Um, and our legislators are going to have to figure out how to minimize the damage and minimize the pain. Um, that will happen beginning in January as our legislators come back to Frankfurt to balance the next year of the budget. So last year they were on track to balance the next two year budget, which is how Kentucky manages its budget. It's a biennial budget. We had something we called the big bold ask in place and it would have started the process of increasing funding for education, early childhood through post-secondary by a billion dollars in six years. Mm -hmm. Um, it was something that, it was a plan that was attractive to policymakers that we thought we could get some headway on, um, infusing the entire pipeline of the system with additional resources over six years. But then COVID hit and uh, what happened, our legislators had to balance a one-year budget, um, stem, uh, stem the tide to the extent that they could and make the decision to come back this January to balance the next one-year budget. So it's going to be really difficult from a financial standpoint, I'm afraid, and there are going to be a lot of needs out there. Um, so I'll just wrap up with, again, the importance of our communities coming together, communities in our neighborhoods in, um, uh, that wrap around each one of our schools, that wrap around our districts, and us all coming together and figuring this out um, for, um, for each other and for our progress forward. We can't let COVID keep us from the progress that we need to make as Kentuckians and as a state. 
Well, uh, I want to uh, actually, Tony, if I could go back to you for this question, but I appreciate everybody's thoughts on it is one of the things that the uh, uh, two or three months that we had as the uh, last school year ended is uh, uh, sort of a, a period of discovery for parents uh, in various ways, uh, including how difficult teaching is. Uh, uh, and uh, we also happened uh, to go through that at a time when a lot of parents uh, had were also coming home to work. So they were there to be uh, uh, with their children. Uh, as we move into the fall and further into the year, the possibility that uh, parents are going back to work and don't have, uh, uh, can't, aren't home with their children. And I'm, I'm certain that there were, you know, certainly uh, people who uh, didn't have that advantage in the, uh, uh, in the as spring came, but it could be even more challenging in the, the fall if students are at home or have to come home. Um, uh, I'm just wondering what the uh, the parent experience. Uh, 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 there may be, uh, and, and Bridget's uh, 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 use the word silver lining in that as well, is because you had more parental involvement in education maybe than in uh, in uh, before. But so could you all just reflect a bit on the, the, the apparent uh, relationship, the parent interaction with the school, the parent as teacher, uh, those kinds of things? Um, I, for, um, from my experience and the people that um, I'm with a lot, um, I have two boys at home. Um, both of my sons are special needs kids. So it added an added challenge for me. I am not an educator in any sense of the word, but you would be amazed at what you can do when you have to do that. Um, and as a parent, that, that educator connection that we made during the, during the spring, it was crucial for most of us because um, when you are so passionate about education, and I am, and um, for everybody's children, not just my own. So trying to find that um, calm, I've got to teach now, I'm not a teacher, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it was a lot for a lot of parents. We exchanged lots of emails, lots of text messages going back and forth, trying to find um, that support system, which fortunately for us, um, being part of the PTA, there's a lot of us parents, um, and again, all spread out. So we were able to try to um, figure out, come up with new ways, new and creative ways to, to get done what we needed to do, which was to teach our kids the best that we can. Um, and it's hard. It, it, it's very hard. Um, we're constantly saying things like, but I don't know how to teach this. I don't know how to teach this. But we, we got in there and we do it. Um, I just felt like it was um, more scary than anything. Once you get in there and you develop those connections, um, again, with the educators, we did not have um, so much of a rough time. I'm a stay-at-home mom um, because of those two boys, and thank goodness for that. But there were so many that were not stay-at-home parents. Um, some that were still essential workers that had to try to juggle the schoolwork and still going to work every day and, you know, and, and it was a struggle for them. So we tried to um, connect people with as many resources as we can. And that's also our goal going forward. Um, we're advocates, advocates first and foremost. Most people see PTA as fundraisers, but we are not. Um, we actually advocate for all of the kids and all of the programs that we can get our hands on to help our children and the families in our communities. So we're trying to um, figure out different ways of um, keeping that going when school starts up. We're going to also need to be there together and have that that bridge and, and that way to make those connections. So that is something that um, the 14th District PTA Board, we're working on that right now to make sure that we're there for our kids, we're there for the administrators and what they need us to do um, to come and say, hey, we can use this from PTA. Can you guys help with this? This is what we're here for. Um, and one of the things is because our volunteer 
position is going to be much smaller starting up. Um, you know, we can't just walk in schools like we were before and um, participate. But there are so many other things that we can do. So I think moving forward, we've learned, um, as Bridget was saying, we've learned a lot um, since the spring. We're, we're learning and we're pushing forward. Um, but it, it's still going to be a time for us. Okay. So I um, wonder uh, if the superintendents could reflect on that, You, uh, what your what are uh, parents, uh, uh, how did they do in the spring? What are they worried about in the fall? Uh, is there any education for the parents on how to deal with this? Just tell me how you're all thinking through this uh, relationship with the community of parents. Matt? I think we have to do whatever we can to support our parents. Um, they're in a, in a difficult situation um, as we just are as, as school leaders and teachers as well. I'm trying to balance how do I take care of my kids and how do I work and support my family and take care of the needs of the family. Um, so that's where we've tried to be as flexible as we can and some of the plans that we've put into place to try to meet those needs to uh, let parents have some choice in how school may look for them uh, in the coming school year. So, uh, 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 Jay uh, and uh, Alvin, if you don't mind, we have a specific question on this from the audience about what sorts of resources will be available to parents who are uh, working and can't be available on the virtual teaching days. Uh, just, uh, you know, the, the uh, anxiety and, and uncertainty about what, what happens as we start this school year in such a dramatically different model. Well, I'll go ahead and discuss a little bit. I, I think the, the lesson that really rings for me before we get to that question of, about the spring was that for parents, uh, I call it, many of them had to wear the three hats. And, and that would be the hat of the teacher, the hat of the parent, and the hat of being an employee. And that was a really challenging uh, three hat uh, lesson for uh, a, a lot of us to try to balance. So moving into the fall, if, if we can find ways to remove those hats for periods of time uh, to lessen that stress and anxiety uh, on parents, that, that would be uh, really, really helpful. And, and I think that goes back to having um, cooperation from our school communities just on trying to do what we can to slow down the spread of this virus. So uh, that would be the mask wearing, the social distancing, the hand washing, all of those things. So that, um, you know, we, we went from having all kids all day, five days to, to not having them at all. Uh, can, can, we, can we relieve some of that pressure uh, to start the school year and then build back into it? So uh, one of my concerns is certainly the group that out there uh, that has to wear what I call the three hats. Uh, and, and that's not an easy um, load for, for our parents to carry. Uh, to answer the question about what resources are going to be available, I think that that, that ranges from uh, child to child, student to student, and, and grade level to grade level. So what I'm going to say is that uh, parents need to be strong advocates and great communicators with their school uh, and making sure they're always feeling like uh, they can ask for that assistance. You know, you, you, you've got to be, uh, I, I believe that when you're, when you're a parent or a guardian, um, you're, you're kind of the general contractor of building that house. Uh, and you've got to keep uh, stepping in there and talking to the individuals that are building into your child. So uh, you've got to be their strongest advocate and uh, continue to ask those great questions about what, what you can, can, can seek out to, to help along that way. So as far as specifics, uh, I'm not sure how I can get down to, to, into specifics until we had a little bit more specifics about um, what exactly they're looking for. But again, um, I would try to show a little bit of grace to schools uh, as we go through this time period, uh, but certainly don't uh, walk away from uh, being an advocate for your child and getting those resources and uh, the, the the, the collaboration that you need and, and, and that your child deserves. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up uh, where superintendent Brewer sort of left off. And I think um, for, 
for us, uh, although I don't have any of my own, I have 4,000 in Covington. Mm -hmm. And uh, reflecting on uh, what some of the feedback we received from parents, I think, uh, first and foremost, I, I think our parents were extremely appreciative of, uh, of, of the efforts that the school district made back in the spring to uh, deliver food, to continue those relationships as Executive uh, Director Ramsey talked about. Um, so I, I think they were extremely appreciative of our efforts. And uh, I think going forward, everything that we're trying to do is uh, sort of similar to what uh, I think uh, Superintendent Turner and Brewer talked about is trying to relieve some of that stress on parents, trying to relieve that anxiety. Uh, what we hope to do is we hope that with our new model, our hybrid model, we can take some of that stress off parents through, uh, if we're able to have some in-person, uh, instruct kids a couple of days a week so that the other three days they, uh, that they may not be in school, that they feel like they have some guidance so they don't have to lean on their parents as much. Uh, also, uh, again, in some of our, for our online or strictly virtual learners, and it also goes to not, you know, the kids that are not virtual, the ones that are in school, but three days. We hope with some of our, 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 our technology that we will, you know, everything's going to have uh, cliff notes for parents in a sense. Parents can go to our learning management system and see how they can support their students if they want to get that involved. Again, the goal is to uh, try to make it so with that two days a week we have with kids, we really want to uh, emphasize uh, what we expect kids to be able to do those three days they're away from us. And so that is what we're hoping, uh, the importance of getting that to getting that opportunity to spend that couple of days a week with kids. We're hoping that uh, the students won't have to lean on parents. I also have to, uh, I thank our teachers and they did a great job with this last spring, but I anticipate that we're gonna get so much better is that outreach, you know, teachers being able uh, with our schedule and I'm sure the other two districts are similar. With our schedule, we're having kids in, in school uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday. So the goal with that Wednesday will be outreach from teachers, calling kids, calling families, you know, seeing what help, what support they need. Uh, and, and that's hopefully going to relieve parents of some of that anxiety and some of that, uh, that, that challenge that they have to deal with, with keeping their students engaged and, and, and just, yeah, we're hoping we can hoping we can support them and be able to, of assistance. Okay. Hope I answered it. Yeah, Mark, I want to add a little bit more in there as I'm trying to help parents reassure them what schools have been doing since the, the spring. And, and I know many of my peers are doing the same thing. Um, you know, we're going to have a tremendously, a tremendous amount of uh, teachers that are now Google certified and have taken the Google classroom compared to what we had in the spring. Uh, the use of, Microsoft Teams and Zooms and all those things. Teachers have, the learning curve for that has gone through the roof. Um, I, I know many districts have used the, the funding that's coming in uh, to go complete, to, to ensure that every uh, child has a one-to-one -one device. For, for example, in the spring, we were not there. We were one-to-one -one seven through 12. Uh, we are now gonna be one-to-one -one, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade and even possibly preschool through 12th grade. So that's gonna open up a whole nother uh, avenue for, for parents as far as resources and communications. We've all been working uh, tirelessly to shore up uh, the, the learning platforms uh, that are out there, uh, the Edmentum and trying to pair the coursework with that. Uh, our, our reading and math series at the elementary level, really trying to make sure there's that strong online component, uh, working with teachers uh, so that we can, if, if we're able to start the year, and I'm optimistic that we're able to do that in some sort of fashion and, and, and start getting a routine in for students that we can flip that switch at any time and saying, you know, at home doesn't always have to look differently than at school uh, and, and having that mindset going along that way. So um, I really think we're gonna see uh, a much better um, teaching model 
in, in the fall with what's going to happen at home because of those things. Um, you, you know, I, I want to take a, a moment to uh, applaud an organization that really stepped up um, this summer and, and filled a great need for us. It's a great example of the energy in our Northern Kentucky community. Um, a, a need has always been students that don't have uh, internet at home. And that's always been a, been an obstacle for um, teachers when they start talking about their school year. Well, you know, schools provide devices, but we're not necessarily going to provide the internet at home. So much like providing someone a car, but not giving them any gas. It's not, it's nice, but you know, we're not going to get around the block. So um, I, I'm fortunate to be on the United Way uh, NKY action team and working with some fabulous folks there. And we brought that problem to the table for Northern Kentucky and uh, collaborating with the Horizon Fund and collaborating with Cincinnati Bell, we now have a program in which families can apply for uh, free internet access at home. And that's just not my district in Dayton, that's just not Alvin, that is all districts in Northern Kentucky. Again, that showed the unity of Northern Kentucky. We didn't say just take care of one group, we said take care of all of us. Uh, and it was very exciting to see, I saw an announcement from United Way, they've expanded that down into Grant County. Uh, they're doing that over uh, in Cincinnati as well. So, uh, you know, people are really stepping up and taking on these uh, uh, challenges when they're in front of us and getting over those hurdles. So can, uh, I, I just wanna commend uh, the folks at uh, United Way, uh, Cincinnati Bell, and the Horizon Fund for, for, for filling that need in Northern Kentucky, which we didn't have in the spring. So uh, I think that's going to create a whole nother look for um, parent students uh, and, and the educational experience they're going to have here in the fall. Bridget, if I could pick up on that with uh, you, uh, because uh, you mentioned things that the Pritchard Committee uh, would be advocating for in this question of the digital divide, which has come up a bit uh, a time or two in today's discussion. And I just completed a, 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 some a focus groups with uh, a, a nonprofits in Covington and Newport about their needs and the digital divide comes up over and again. For instance, in Newport, Monmouth Street, the main drag, a lot of the businesses have free Wi-Fi, but if you get away from Monmouth Street, not so much. Uh, so uh, to that point, uh, I've seen a lot of effort to get uh, the hardware into the, the uh, uh, households, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, if you don't have uh, 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 Wi-Fi, in fact, on the focus group that we, we did, uh, one of the participants had pulled into the parking lot of the uh, library. The library is closed, but the Wi-Fi still worked. Uh, so people are finding ways. But uh, And then issues that the social service agency said is if they, you have a cell phone and it's on a minute plan, you don't have 20 minutes to talk to a social worker, which I guess translates into you don't have 20 minutes to talk to a teacher either. So. Is there an advocacy, you know, there's, there, there, uh, does this uh, place the Pritchard Committee uh, as an advocate for uh, uh, better Wi-Fi wi access in the state? Mark, this is one of the primary, primary equity issues of this pandemic is the digital divide. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned um, it's, it's about infrastructure, it's about access, which for many families is about the ability to pay for adequate um, internet. Um, but for some families, particularly in rural areas of the state, um, even if they have the means, the infrastructure is simply not there. Um, so the last mile, as it's referred to, um, is not to folks' homes in much of Kentucky yet. So the digital divide is a serious and significant issue that we're facing in the delivery of education, um, K-12, though some may say early childhood as well, um, but certainly also in post-secondary. Um, it's, a, it's a remote learning issue, it's a remote work issue, it's a remote access to healthcare issue. Um, and again, our systems responded rapidly in the spring with hotspots, with drive-in broadband opportunities um, at the public library, as you mentioned, Mark. Um, our KCTCS system across the state provided those hotspot parking lots. So did some businesses, particularly in rural areas like McDonald's and others. Um, we've heard about, you know, school buses being uh, wired as a hotspot and driving to rural areas um, so that families could access the internet. 
Um, but that rapid response, um, it will not be sufficient as we move forward again to a next normal and a new normal. So hearing about the collaboration from United Way, Cincinnati Bell and Horizon Funds is exactly the next step we need for the fall. Um, ultimately, though, for a new normal, we need universal access to broadband as much as we needed, um, you know, universal access to electricity and water 100 years ago. So this is the way we work, learn, and access healthcare, and will be in the future. So we've been appealing to Congress uh, for um, funding in the stimulus package um, to provide more infrastructure and to provide better access for families. That will likely become a conversation in the legislative session in January as well. Um, and there will have to be some innovative approaches. Uh, past the collaboration that Jay shared, um, again, that kind of as the next, the next normal, what ultimately is the new normal? And that's what we have to figure out with those who are building the infrastructure and those who are ensuring families have adequate access at an affordable price. I see uh, Alvin uh, Garrison uh, uh, nodding a lot uh, in agreement to things you say. Uh, Superintendent Garrison, would you, you uh, 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 what is the situation in, uh, in Covington and uh, how uh, do you have ways you've addressed it already and creative ways ahead? Uh, just what's that uh, look like from your perspective? Uh, well, yes, like uh, Superintendent Brewer mentioned, uh, of course, we've been a part of the United Way, that partnership, and that was great. And I appreciate Superintendent Brewer's leadership on that. Um, yes, access was huge for us, uh, like, Super, like Dayton Independent. We, uh, Covington, we, uh, we had, uh, I guess, had uh, foreshadowed the uh, need to uh, start down that path of providing computers in kids' hands to take home. I credit our board for their leadership on that. So uh, early on, we had we had the infrastructure of, of computers 6th through 12th grade. Uh, we had one-to-one -one capacity. However, because it came in such a urgent manner with the COVID, we were not prepared for our, 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 our middle school students to take their device home because we hadn't had any uh, parent things, parent consent forms or anything like that. So unfortunately, we were not prepared to send those home. But when we talk about access and we talk about equity, uh, Executive Director Ramsey hit the nail on the head. There is a digital uh, there are digital inequities. There are kids being left behind due to access. And that was very evident here in Covington. Um, you know, when we do our surveys about uh, what kind of access students had, uh, we've, we've, we've done surveys like that in the past. And what we found is that uh, a lot of times kids would say when, you know, I guess we didn't word our questions properly, but what kind of access do you have to internet? Uh, a lot of our families will say, well, we have access. We've got it on a phone, maybe. You know, our parents, the phone that we share among the family. Well, is that truly enough access to, uh, to do work on, to contact your teachers, to have those online meetings with teachers or, you know, that uh, Google Meets or Team Microsoft? It, it was it's insufficient. Uh, lucky for us, you talked about innovation. Uh, lucky for us, our city city of Covington understood a need uh, with this digital divide and uh, uh, the, with the leadership of Mary Marr and, uh, and city manager Johnston, uh, Covington's now uh, looking to expand free uh, internet access to uh, the entire city of Covington for the next five years. And uh, it required a partnership between the city between some private industry, between the school district. And, and we're hopeful that that will help with some of the digital divide. Uh, we still understand there still could be a need for us to provide hotspots um, in some cases, depending on where kids live. But uh, I just, I'm so thankful that uh, the city of Covington saw that need and, and understands the inequities uh, when some kids have access and others do not. It's, it's a huge opportunity gap uh, for students and families. And it's important that we figure that gap out and, and close that gap uh, because it's just, it's imperative. So I'll leave it at that. 
Thank you. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we have some questions uh, coming in. I remind the audience, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to uh, ask them. But we've had several questions that in aggregate really boil down to the fact of the matter that uh, parents are worried about their children going back into a place uh, where uh, monitoring social distancing and whether children will wear masks and where you uh, right now, if we're at home with our family, we kind of know who's been where and we can monitor that. And it's uh, uh, scary to go back into a, a situation where that's less controlled. Um, we have uh, one question specifically wondering if um, our school districts have consulted with Children's Hospital, which is uh, of course a world renowned uh, medical facility in our region. Uh, are you getting advice from there or other places? Um, uh, another question uh, wondering what are the triggers? Where do you look and say, uh, uh, uh oh, we, uh, this isn't working. We're going to have to uh, uh, shut it down or rethink it. Uh, but essentially, those questions get at, and you can deal with those specifics, but get at um, uh, uh, the worry about the health of their children that parents have that's so real right now. I think uh, if you'd like me to start, I can start on that. I think uh, first uh, that. Uh, parents, uh, uh, we hope to reassure them that uh, we would not want to put uh, our students or teachers, faculty, and staff in any position that will compromise their health and safety. Uh, that is not something that uh, we intentionally, intentionally would like to do, uh, but we do stay in contact, not necessarily with children's, but the uh, health department, the state health department, the Northern Kentucky Health Department. I think uh, each district uh, are, have them on speed dial as we develop our plans. We follow the lead of our governor and our educational, uh, and our Kentucky Department of Education. So yes, we are, we are taking all that guidance to heart as we design our reopening plans. And uh, to answer the question about what is the mark when you say it's not working, I don't know if we have that answer. I think the uh, health department's monitoring the COVID in the region, and they're disseminating guidance to us based on that. So if the health department says, or if the governor says it's not safe to have school, uh, here in Covington, we're going to follow that guidance. Uh, but uh, again, uh, you know, our goal is to try to provide the best education possible for our kids during this pandemic. And uh, I think our number one priority is the health and safety of our students, families, and our teachers and, and faculty and staff. So I'll turn it over to one of my colleagues there <laughs> and see if they have some additional thoughts. I, I agree completely with Superintendent Garrison. The safety of our students and the safety of our teachers has to be our top priority. Um, then we also have to do consider our students uh, as well, because uh, I do worry about some of the, uh, the effects of being away from school, of, of being away from uh, uh, friends, from the, the learning gap that we've talked about and that, that loss of instruction and learning. Um, uh, I was also very concerned to hear in the news recently about the uh, the number of referrals uh, for abuse um, for young kids and how knowing how there's adults in school that pay close attention to those things and are responsible for some of those referrals. So it's it's a tough balance. We know that schools are, are one of the safest places for many of our kids in normal times. Um, but now there is a, is a great fear um, of, of maybe getting sick at school uh, that we know some of our students and parents have. And uh, as, as my colleagues already mentioned, we'll, we'll, we'll do everything we can to follow the guidance that's been put out there by, uh, by the state, by the Kentucky Department of Education, consulting with the uh, Northern Kentucky Health Department as well. Um, you know, and we're going to have to look at things holistically, I think. There's not going to be simply one measure that we have to, to keep track of that's going to determine everything. Uh, it's going to be a lot of things because, uh, to be honest, there's lots of movement between our counties, between our, our, our cities. Um, we have people that work um, from, from Boone County in all the neighboring counties, neighboring states as well, that are traveling on a regular basis uh, to go to work. And um, it, it makes it very complex and very complicated. Tony, I think you have some slides. Maybe we could call one of those up that show what a classroom and uh, uh, 
the lunchroom isn't going to look the same. I think maybe these are things the site-based council has been working at uh, on Scott. And if you could talk about those and uh, maybe if the superintendents can say, does th this uh, look familiar to you? I mean, everybody's looking at your physical space and how to redesign it. So Tony, just uh, tell us what we're looking at here. Sure. When we were uh, making our plans um, and trying to finalize a few things as far as trying to make sure that everything was as safe for our students to return as possible. Um, and this was um, an example of one of the classrooms that Scott, this is with the six foot distance um, between desks. There's also another slide that shows it from a different angle on how the room would look. So the parents can be a little more assured that you know, we are working on that proper spacing and um, so the classrooms look safe and our kids can go back. And then what happens in this case is it, we're utilizing about 15 desks, I think on average is, um, if I remember correctly, per classroom. So with the balance of those desks not being utilized when we normally have 28 to 30 students, we have now moved those tables are now the cafeteria tables. So um, we have an overhead view of what the cafeteria at Scott will look like when the kids return. Again, those are the same desks used in the classroom and we will have the chairs, of course, but that's also using that six foot um, distancing as required. It is a little bit different. Um, we're used to seeing those long tables or round tables in the cafeteria. It's gonna be um, a little bit more challenging. They're all going to be assigned seats. So each student will have a number assigned to them. And um, because of the way that we're also doing, we're currently splitting the days um, to make sure that we can keep our numbers small in the classroom. For instance, on one day, um, we're going to have three periods in a day um, as opposed to the standard five. The next day we will have two periods and a what we call fly there, which is where they're going to do their social emotional learning pieces um, on that second day. And um, those will also um, be assigned to keep the student from going um, back and forth through so many classes, just limit it to those three. Um, but within two days, they'll have all five of their classes and there'll be a little bit longer periods each day. Um, so I know that it's um, going to look different for a lot of people um, trying to plan and I'm sure the other superintendents are doing the same, you know, the same thing, trying to come up with these um, plans on how to lay out um, different sections of your schools. and. Um, we've even discussed um, the hallways. We have some hallways that that are wider in the newer wings of the schools, and those are going to be two-way hallways, um, single file, six-foot spacing. In the older um, in the older areas, that's not possible, and those will become one-way hallways. So the schools are really doing a lot. Um, I feel a lot better moving forward as a parent, thinking we're trying to cover. They're covering as much as we can find and of course there's going to be holes in it um, because we're just learning as we go and we're finding out different things that each school needs and there, there's not a one size fits all um, for everybody but um, for the parents just you know they can speak up if there's something that you're concerned about bring that to your your administrators your principals and whoever you have you know you can get an ear um, and let them know what your concerns are. They can't be addressed if we don't address them. And so um, also if there is a PTA in your school, contact us. We, we don't mind making contact to the superintendent um, or the principals if we can to try to help alleviate some of that as well and kind of help bridge that to see what the parents are seeing um, just so that the you know, administrators know as well. Uh, Jay Brewer, I wonder if I could go to you for a minute. I wonder if those uh, um, floor layouts look uh, familiar to you. Uh, uh, all the, uh, each of you as superintendents, you have a finite amount of space uh, and you have to rethink that space. So um, how's that going and what's it look like? 
Yeah, certainly we've put together models in both of our buildings uh, and we have classrooms that vary in size and, and that's one of the things we're really trying to fine tune right now is matching up uh, our larger classrooms uh, of students with the larger uh, classroom. So um, yeah, I mean, under our current model, uh, We've got about 75% of our students committed to coming back to school, 25% staying at home. So we have a reduction already coming back of 25%. And then we're taking that 75% of our students and, and dividing them into uh, uh, half groups. So um, we've really reduced the number of students that we're going to put into the classroom uh, right away. Uh, so we feel pretty good about that. Uh, we've got to get real good at the uh, effective practices, you know, the wearing of the mask. Uh, and the mask is going to have to be worn a lot, uh, you know, um, in, in school. Um, and uh, the, the hand sanitizing, the washing the hands, the social distancing, we've got to become very effective at that or we're not going to be able to have school very long. Um, you know, those are going to be very key, no matter what distancing you do, if those things aren't, uh, in place and, uh, adhered to. And again, that's where we need support from parents. You know, uh, we can't have them telling little Johnny, I don't believe in these masks and I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that because it's going to make our job very hard, uh, to have school this fall, uh, when they start hearing those things. So. Um, I do want to reassure some folks, I've seen some of the questions that since March, uh, superintendents have a weekly phone call with the Commissioner of Education and the Department of Education for two hours. Uh, and often, very often, maybe even always, uh, there are a couple folks from the health department, doctors uh, giving recommendations, giving uh, advice, direction as far as uh, how we approach school, how we work with the virus, uh, how we do those types of things. I've seen some folks saying we need to uh, contact Children's Hospital directly, uh, which I personally have not done. But again, reassuring folks that uh, we've had strong medical advice uh, from the state uh, since day one of this. And each and every week, uh, we have direct line to those folks where we can ask questions and get feedback from them. Uh, our Northern Kentucky Health Department's been uh, very supportive of our efforts uh, when we reach out to them and they reach out to us with those types of things. So, uh, but yeah, Mark, those classrooms uh, look very familiar uh, as far as getting them uh, simplified uh, for students and staff coming this fall. Uh, Matt Turner, you have a lot of buildings in your school district as the largest district in our region. Um, um, how about for you and uh, dealing with the physical space? There's a lot of similarities to what uh, my two colleagues have mentioned in that, you know, the uh, social distancing essentially reduces your capacity by about 50% in general. Um, you know, we feel like in, in, in our district across our schools, and, and we've got some older schools and some newer schools and some a little larger and some a little smaller. So it varies a little bit for us school by school. Um, but we gave our parents a choice on virtual or in-person instruction. It was about 70%, 30%, 70% uh, in-person, 30% uh, virtual for us. And we're going to be using a hybrid model to, to break them into two groups. So that 70% will then be divided into 35% of our overall student population in a general sense. Uh, there are some slight differences amongst the school, but that's, that's one of the ways that we, we have to go about that. Uh, I was reading a couple questions in the, uh, the Q&A there about uh, the numbers and only being in school on certain days. To do that, that's the only way that we feel like we can really keep kids safe is to reduce the number of kids in the building on one single day. Uh, and I know that doesn't answer questions for parents that gotta work and they gotta, they gotta take care of child childcare issues and, and things of that nature. Um, but you know that that's that spacing is 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 a challenge. It's a big challenge for lunch, and, and when we uh, we lose lunchroom space, that's been a big, big logistical hurdle for some of our schools. And how do we effectively feed students if you space them all out? You lose 50% of your capacity. That means you have to practically double the length of your lunch period, or or double the space, you know, and, and put lunch in different areas within the building. 
you know, so our principals have done a great job of being very creative and trying to make that work. Um, but reducing those numbers and making sure that we wear masks, those are things that we've got to do. Um, and, and I hope that all of our parents understand they may not agree or may not like that, but that's the only way we can make sure to keep our students safe and our parents safe. Do you talk about the school bus experience? A bus, bus can be a fairly crowded place after all. Yes, buses are, 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 the, are the same way. There's some, you know, the guidance on buses is that, uh, um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to come on board the bus, but they'll have to be wearing a mask. Uh, they'll be on the bus for a fairly short time. If they're masked, there's, you know, there's not as much concern at that point that we have to be socially distanced. Uh, because if we did socially distance on the bus, there would only be about 10 kids on the bus at any one given time. Um, we'd have to run multiple bus, bus runs through the through, through our district and there's no way we could we could manage getting kids to school on time. Um, so buses will be cleaned after the, after the kids are out and so we'll maintain sanitation in the buses but it's going to be a little bit different and then once they get off the buses and get to the schools that's when we'll be conducting temperature checks and uh, some other safety protocols to get them inside the building. I want to uh, pivot a little bit because we have a series of questions around uh, uh, the emotional uh, matters for children uh, that, uh, and I don't want to miss that before we're out of time. Um, there is, uh, obviously it would be, we everybody would like things to come back to normal and children to be able to go to school and uh, interact with their friends and uh, have recess and sports and uh, all the things that are uh, uh, not the textbook part of uh, going to school, uh, but what uh, um, what are your all's thoughts on? Um, uh, and we'll uh, maybe start with the superintendents. But Bridget, I think this is maybe another advocacy question because it's an emerging need. And what's what is our capacity to help uh, families uh, with the emotional uh, um, issues that are surround that surround uh, this huge transition? Uh, do you have plans in place for that or uh, are you, do you have to be so focused on the emergency need of just delivering instruction that you'll get to that or just what, where, where is all that part of the of, of element of, of this crisis? Mark, for our part, that's where we'll come back to the relationship piece being so important um, and maintaining, strengthening relationships between educators, students and families. Um, that being that bright spot that we learned in the spring and making sure it continues into the fall months um, and making sure we're kind of guarding uh, time and energy and uh, the well-being of our teachers such that they can provide that deep relationship support to families and students. Um, that, that's not to discount that there are, I noticed in the Q&A, you know, somebody used the word um, traumatized. And there's no doubt our children are facing all different um, experiences throughout this pandemic. Again, we're not dealing with education in isolation. Um, you know, we've all had to head to the house, so to speak. Um, and so families are trying to make it all work. I have, um, you know, staff members who are trying to, um, you know, full-time support their two young learners who are in elementary school, um, still pull off full-time work with both parents at home, and that's a dual parent family um, with means. Um, I have another staff member who's in a more rural part of the state and is literally working and trying to uh, figure out how his daughter is going to be in kindergarten in the fall with basically nothing more than a hot spot. Um, so there are real challenges and, um, and, and they're impacting us all. I think as adults, we feel it. I know I can feel different one day to the next in how I'm managing um, my own mental well-being, my own emotional well-being through this pandemic. And so I think one kind of refrain that we've heard from educators, um, and I think we hear even among adults now, is, is grace. We've got to, um, yes, we need to make sure that we don't lose ground on progress, but we also need to just provide an awful lot of grace to each other as we're trying to figure this out. And we've got to come together in community um, and figure out how to provide for the needs of each other, um, and each other includes our students, our families, our educators who are, who have families, 
Um, so sometimes that's, I think, um, something we don't get into an awful lot. How many of our teachers do we all know on this call and those listening in who have their own families? And they're trying to not only serve to deliver education for their students, but maintain the education of their own families as well. So it's, it's a monumental task. Um, and there's just not enough to go around, Mark. So we've got to give each other grace and come together more and more. So I'll, I'll take that question to the superintendents and I wonder, uh, you're gonna have more students who are stressed and need help during the school day or after, just how are you thinking about that? I'll I'll, I'll take a stab at that one first, guys. And uh, and two things really jump out to me is, is first and foremost is that uh, brain health is is such an important part of, of what we're talking about here. And, and we have to remember that the brain is an organ, just like our lungs, our kidneys, our heart. And there are certain things that occur within the school uh, day that addresses the need of the brain. Uh, and, and so that's where we're seeing this great advocacy for a push to get kids back in school. Uh, the second piece is the importance of play. And, and I know Bridget in particular has been a, a strong, strong advocate uh, in the early childhood field. And, and uh, I, I think she'll strongly agree that if a child can play, a child can learn. And, and all those underlying uh, behaviors that go into a three or four or five year old learning how to play, how to self regulate, how to get along are, are just so important in the school setting and very, very difficult to uh, replicate uh, virtually with a computer screen at home or sending packets home. So, again, that's where you're seeing this great push uh, from people saying, wow, we've got to get kids back in here for brain health, for socialization, for play, all those things. And then it hits this big wall that says, but what about COVID-19? What about the staff members that are going to be exposed to them? What about the teachers? How do we get these two pieces of a puzzle that don't seem to, to fit right now to fit? And, and that's got a lot of people uneasy uh, and, 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 and concerned about what school is going to look like uh, here in the fall. And again, that's where I'm advocating that that, that, that we walk before we run. Uh, we, we've been using the P word a lot, pivot. You know, I, I like to use the four P's. We're going to pause, we're going to pivot, we're going to plan, and then we're going to proceed. And we're going to do that many, many times this school year. Um, so we're going to do our best, we're going to learn, and then we're going to do better and, and move forward along that way. But it's going to take all of us uh, working together. Uh, and I know Andy Bashir is beating that drum uh, that it is all of us and we've got to be together on this. But, man, we have to be together because there's so many different sides uh, that are coming together uh, all at one time here. Um, but I have great faith uh, in our teachers and our kids. Our, our kids are wonderfully resilient. Uh, don't under underestimate them for a second. Uh, they can certainly do this. Our teachers can do this, and I know our families can do this. So um, excited to take on this challenge here in the fall. I'm going to uh, uh, come off of that word, the resilience word, and uh, go to Superintendent Garrison, if I could. Um, uh, you know, all of us in our uh, childhood experiences have something that we remember that was kind of fundamental to our time, say, in grade school. Uh, some of us remember duck and cover, and we thought the world was going to end with an A-bomb. This is a generation, we, you know, we have a uh, generation of students who uh, came up in 9-11, uh, uh, and now you have a generation of students who have had the COVID uh, uh, period, whatever length of time that may be, and we don't know yet. So what are uh, uh, the resilience of our children and what do we need to be doing to assure that resilience, uh, not just so that they get through this year, but so they get through life? I think uh, first it starts with uh, being good leaders, uh, meaning that uh, kids look to adults for leadership and role models. And uh, as Superintendent Brewer said, our, our kids, our kids are unbelievable. They, you know, that's why when I think in terms of uh, of kids wearing masks, I don't. I, I guess I don't see it. I, I think our kids are going to step up. I think our kids are, you know, they 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 step up to the challenge. When we challenge them to do something, kids will step up. Especially if you have those relationships built with them, uh, kids want to please and they 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 want to be good citizens. And um, so when you're talking in terms of resiliency and persistence, um, 
it's naturally in them and it's up to us to pull it out of them. It's up to us to help them reach their fullest potential. And, and that's, uh, it's up to us to uh, stretch them, to push them, to guide them, to be a role model, to lead them. And, and kids will come through for us. I'm, I'm just a firm believer in that. I've seen it too many times uh, where kids, uh, you, you know, you, you put a problem in front of them, they solve it for you. And that's just uh, uh, believing in the leadership of our students. And, uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a zip code on it. Kids from all backgrounds are capable of leading and taking charge and, and, and being leaders of tomorrow. So, uh, again, for me, I, I just think it's up to us as adults to lead them. And, uh, you know, I think somebody mentioned earlier about parents have their role. Superintendents have our role. Principals and teachers have their roles. Custodians, child nutrition folks have their role. We all have to provide that positive role model a positive example for them to follow and kids will do so. They will step up, they will take the lead and next thing you know, we'll be following them. So again, I, I just, I think it's, I think if we put it out there in front of our students, they will do it and they will do it well. So I'm gonna pass the torch, but I don't wanna get on my soapbox cause I can talk about that all day long. Uh, it just, uh, it amazes me what our kids can do if we, if we put it in front of them and we, we ask them to do it. I, I agree with Superintendent Garrison completely on that. And I think we also got to put it in front of our parents and put it in front of our teachers because they will step to the plate and, and join us with all that as well. Our teachers have worked so hard back in March to the end of the year. They've worked hard getting ready for what's coming with this school year. Um, and, and our parents, I know, will work closely with us. That's why we just have to do a really good job of engaging our communities to help with daycare things of that nature, because I know that's a huge concern for our parents is, is if they're not in school every day, like on a hybrid model, how am I going to get daycare on the other days? What's that going to look like? We're going to have to be really creative and, and, and really thoughtful and involve as everyone in our community to help with that in some way. Uh, Superintendent Turner, if you would stick with us for just a minute, I, uh, I have a question. I want to go back. Uh, uh, Bridget talked about uh, advocating uh, for school funding at the state level, but I, I'd like to hear from the three superintendents, uh, uh, just uh, kind of deal with the fiscal picture for a moment and keep in mind that you have two advocates in uh, Tony and Bridget here to carry your message to those who can help. Uh, and I think our parents on the uh, 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 who are tuned in will wanna know what, what they can do also, but what is your uh, fiscal picture for your uh, your uh, school district, uh, are you going to run out of money or uh, you must be uh, meeting with your budget directors a lot? Yeah, we're, we're meeting on a regular basis and trying to keep a very close uh, close eye on, on our budget numbers. You know, it's complicated by the fact of what we're going through now and having to prepare for school like this is we're having to expend quite a few dollars on technology needs. Uh, some infrastructure needs, some uh, additional cleaning supplies and personal protective equipment and, and some of those things that, that we have to have. Um, I, I think I may speak for my colleagues a little bit is the, the greatest concern we have is probably towards the end of the school year when we get into the second half and, uh, and we may not know what the funding picture is going to look like coming from the state. Uh. Alvin Garrison, Jay Brewer, additional thoughts on the, the uh, money picture for our local school districts? I'll, I'll let Alvin go first and I'll, I'll hit clean up on this one. Hi, well, yeah, again, I think you hit it on the head and then Superintendent Turner definitely hit it on the head. I think um, it's from a, it, we're, we're staying in close contact with our finance directors. Uh, but I think the, the concern that I have uh, is revenue, incoming revenue. Uh, with the pandemic, will people be able to pay their taxes, especially the local dollars? So right now, it's, I think it's hard to predict because we, uh, we, start, we start collecting revenue through taxes towards the, you know, towards the fall. And so with the stress on families right now, I, I just don't know 
how much revenue we'll receive. So we really, uh, I think most districts now are trying to prepare for the rainy day or the storm, which will be possibly in the spring uh, again, you know, with the, with the pandemic and people not being able to work. And uh, it's just a, a real concern. Will revenue dollars come in, especially from a local tax standpoint? And then of course, uh, statewide budget, the, uh, the information we're receiving now uh, doesn't uh, seem to be positive. So again, we're just uh, preparing for a rainy day, uh, being frugal in a sense, while trying to make sure we meet the needs of our students, families, and uh, and and meet the needs. So it's it's one of uh, another challenge that the the pandemic has put in our in, in front of us. And again, we will deal with it the best we can. I'll pick it up there. I mean, I'm, I got to be careful how I say this, but we may go broke um, trying to educate our students, and I'm fine with that. Because if we go broke, I have great confidence that the leaders in Kentucky and our community will rally around us and say, you know, there, there's no greater tool to build tomorrow's future than education. And if our school systems have gone broke, I am not going to hesitate to buy computers for kids now. They've already had a great setback in the spring. We can't afford another setback. I'm not going to hesitate to buy them um, the online virtual platform that they need. And if that means in the spring, um, I get on the, the, the watch list for, for, for financial standings, that's where we're going to have to be. Uh, now, I'm not going to be reckless with the spending that we're going to have. I'm, I'm not buying everybody ponies here at Dayton Schools. But uh, we've got to make sure that the immediate need, we've got kids in very critical learning stages right now that uh, they've already fallen behind. We're starting to see the statistics on that, what the, 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 the gap is for a lot of our students. Uh, we can't play it conservative here in the fall and say, we're going to sit on our money, we're going to sit on our resources. Um, so I think that's where we're seeing a lot of students or a lot of superintendents saying, we're all in. You know, every dime that we have is going to making sure sure that uh, students get the services that they need and schools are as safe as they can be. Um, again, if uh, in, in the spring we're all uh, going around with our little tin cup uh, down in Frankfurt, that, that I'll be sitting right next to Matt and Alvin, uh, you know, down there in Frankfurt with it because uh, our kids deserve that. So. Um, but yeah, Mark, the finances are a concern. Uh, but I will say there's there's been uh, a nice uh, federal relief for that uh, to a certain extent. We've seen some resources coming in. Uh, I still think it's much too early to tell uh, where we're going to be uh, with revenue here from the state uh, in the next budget. Um, but again, I have great faith in Kentuckians to support education, and I know they'll do that for our kids. Well, uh, folks, we're about out of time, so I'm going to uh, uh, just ask for some closing thoughts for from everyone. And uh, Tony, maybe it's a good time to uh, start uh, uh, with the PTA and uh, what you'll be advocating for, and uh, just uh, reflections on where we're at and where we um, where we're headed. Well, currently, the um, District 14 PTA. We're looking forward to providing some free um, type of um, competitions for kids. So um, one of them is our reflections competition and the other one is we're trying to get something together for Unity Day, which is the first Monday um, before, or the Monday before Thanksgiving. So with those things, it just gives the kids another outlet here in Northern Kentucky. It's art, it's music, it's photography, it's all of those things. Um, kids actually can win things here, move on to the national level, which we just um, went through that presentation the other day. There's, there's so much that we can do for students. So if you do not have a PTA in your school, then please reach out for us or, or to us because we'd love to help you. There's lots of programs that we can do when things seem limited within that school building. Um, or within your district, there's things that we can do when you need something um, or you have an idea of things that PTA could possibly help you with, then reach out because that's what we're there for. We're here to advocate for the kids. And as far as the parents, anything that you need, reach out to, reach out to us. We're going to advocate 
for whatever you need when we need to do so. Um, but reach out so that we'll know how to help you. And above anything else, as a parent, just make a plan. Talk to your kids before school starts. Let them know so they're not afraid and everything's going to be okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, if I could go to you, I first knew of the Pritchard Committee in the 1980s as you worked toward school reform. And I know that a lot of that work is at the state level, but uh, the Pritchard Committee of today is also very active in uh, uh, building capacity locally in uh, par parental environment. Uh, what's that look like for the Pritchard Committee now that we're in this environment? And uh, any other closing remarks? You know, Mark, a couple years ago, I think we could see that um, our conversations about progress in education, um, early childhood, K-12, post-secondary, were really going to be hyper-local. Um, and that we needed to kind of renew the committee's work in mobilizing communities around a big vision for our state. So we know that in the past 30 years, Kentucky has climbed from the bottom of the national rankings to roughly the middle in um, outcomes across the board, give or take. And now is the time for the next generation to step up and in service to the work of um, the generation that came before us to ensure that Kentucky makes the next giant leap um, in progress and rivals the top tier of all states as we know we can. Um, and so the work today, uh, a pandemic that we could not have foreseen, but this pandemic means things are even more hyper local than I think we could have ever imagined. So now is the time for communities to say, okay, you know, it's right here. It's right here on our street. It's right here in our neighborhood. It's right here, wherever right here is, and we've got to get it right. We've got to get it right with our neighbors, with our families. Um, we've just got to get it right. Um, we've got to think creatively. We've got to think out of the box. We've got to be innovative. Um, and if that's with community organizations, it's in um, you know uh, small networks of uh, parents coming together, whatever it is. Public school is a promise um, that we make to each other, and it's time that we all step up and be part of delivering on that promise. And so we at the Pritchard Committee want to help folks be that, do that, um, to the best of our ability collectively. The last thing, and I'll add in the chat box, Mark, um, a link to our Groundswell Initiative, which is our effort to, to renew in a new generation that mobilized citizens uh, movement um, that led us from the bottom to the middle of uh, the national rankings. Um, so I'll add that in the chat box. The last thing that I'll say is I know we're having a conversation about K-12, but I encourage folks to not forget about our post-secondary students. Don't forget about your students at NKU, your students at Gateway, um, your students who are home from any of our colleges and universities in the state or out of state. This is a daunting time for them as well. Um, we've heard many of them say, maybe next year is the time for us to take a gap year. Maybe if I'm a graduating senior, it's not time for me to go on to college. We need to work against that, um, work against that despair and help support them on their path, knowing that post-secondary education will be a change agent for them as individuals and for their families and communities. Great, thank you. And we're gonna move through with the superintendents if we could go in the uh, order of uh, uh, Matt uh, Turner, Jay Brewer, Alvin Garrison, that would be uh, great, please gentlemen. And um, the uh, if you don't mind, uh, just final reflections, but also a word on the question of what can we as citizens, whether we have parents in the school district or not, uh, how can we be help uh, contribute, advocate? Um, what's an action step for uh, the citizens of Northern Kentucky? There we go. First, I just want to echo what uh, Executive Director Ramsey just said, that we've got to, to all gather together and, uh, and, and, you know, in general, I think we have to kind of wrap our hands around our teachers and hold them up and protect them and work with them and support them because they're going to do, they're going to do their absolute best to help our kids. And so we've got to hold them up and, and, and support them like, 
uh, like our healthcare workers were earlier in this in this pandemic. We've got to really support them because they go out there every single day and put everything they got into it. Um, and, and I think we have to do a similar thing within our communities, as, as was previously said. We've got to really engage uh, everyone in our communities. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to take care of our families, but we've got to take care of other people in our communities as well. We can't simply just uh, sit back and and watch. We've got to be active and be and, and help. We've got so many people that will do those things, and we just all have to be together uh, to do that. I really I agree with one thing, Mr. Brewer, uh, Superintendent Brewer said a little bit earlier, is that I, I'm I'm optimistic in a certain way because. W- we do have an opportunity here to really reimagine what school looks like and how we can effectively uh, educate all of our students and help all of our students uh, be the best they they can be and do whatever they want to do uh, after they get out of school. Um, So I think this is an opportunity, but the only way we're going to be able to get through it all and make it work is doing it together. Thank you. All right, I guess that's on to me. Uh, Specifically, what can our community do? Uh, Just do the smart, basic things. It's always the little things that add up. Wear your mask, wash your hands, watch the social distancing. You've got to model those behaviors for our kids. Uh, If you're looking for something beyond that, uh, get on the United Way link. uh, Sponsor, you can sponsor uh, families for uh, wireless internet. Uh, Would like to see a little surge here coming tonight of uh, Donations United Way to help with that cause. Uh, Great way to do that. And then I guess my final thought, uh, well, two final thoughts is just first of all, I want to thank just our our school communities out there. Uh, You've been fantastic, fantastic. I think sometimes we get caught up with the 5% group of the outliers and and where we are on that. But we've got a strong base that's really willing to take this on uh, and work uh, proactively to do that. So uh, my final thoughts are, uh, you know, parents out there, don't underestimate yourself. Uh, You've got great power. You've got great ability. You can take this on. Teachers, don't underestimate yourself either. And then folks, don't underestimate our kids. Uh, They can do amazing things. I don't think they left me anything to say, but I'll try. (laughs) Um, I think in in closing that um, that when when thinking in terms of what the community can do to support our schools or our district, I heard this term, I think twice, grace. Uh, Understand that our school districts are trying to balance the academic, the social emotional and the health and safety of our students, our faculty, staff, uh, of just everyone. We're trying to balance all of that. And I'll say this, uh, that we're, you know, we're we're doing the best we can. We would never intentionally put anyone in harm's way. We're trying to do what we think is best for uh, students first, uh, families, and the community. So, uh, again, when we talk about what we can do as general citizens, I think uh, I think it was already said well before me. Uh, support your school districts, support your teachers. Uh, like Superintendent Brewer says, be a great role model. Uh, practice what we preach. I think think as a community, uh, I, you know, this little book. I know our our co op shares it with us all the time. We're stronger together. So keep that in mind. We're stronger together. So I thank you all for indulging me and then giving me an opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of uh, the other school districts around the area. Uh, and I just, I, I, I wanna assure parents and families and everybody listening, we can do this. We can do this together. So that's about all I have to say. All right, so before we say goodbye, I'm gonna go back to Tony because the grassroots are so important to all of this. And we've asked the superintendents to talk about how uh, the community can support. And really, uh, Superintendent Garrison's question, Tony, can we do this? We can. I think the parents are gonna be determined and um, determined parents bring determined kids. So I think um, all together and with a positive outlook from all the superintendents and the principals, I think we're going to be fine. It's it's a little, a little troublesome, it's a little worry, but I think first day we're going to be fine. I, I think we're going to surprise ourselves in what we can accomplish. Thank you all, and uh, what you uh, don't hear but is out there is the applause of the audience. So thank you very much for being with us, audience. Thank you. 
Uh, and I remind everybody, uh, uh, you can follow the forum on Facebook or at nkyforum.org. Uh, and we will have uh, some additional uh, uh, forums. We're scheduling uh, some uh, interesting ones coming up. Uh, we've got uh, uh, one uh, already on the agenda, so take a look at uh, uh, that. And we're always happy to hear from you. Uh, you can email us from that site on ideas, on topics that you would like us to cover. I want to thank all of the superintendents and the education advocates for standing for our public schools and for education in our community and for leading us through this crisis. And uh, thank everyone for being with us this evening. We will archive this uh, forum on the forum site. So if you want to uh, share it, uh, uh, watch, uh, watch it in all or part, it's, uh, it's available and uh, tell those who missed it that uh, uh, they haven't missed it entirely. You can still tune in. So thanks everyone and uh, good night.